So uh, as Dr. Jacobs said, I uh, am also a adult reconstruction uh, surgeon. Um, I actually did my fellowship with Dr. Jacobs at, at Rush um, in 03, 04. So if, if there's anything that you have a problem with that I, that I tell you this morning, uh, take it up with Dr. Jacobs, it's, it's his <laughs> fault. Um, so I'm in uh, academic practice uh, in New York City uh, at uh, Mount Sinai. And um, I started a company about three years ago called Monogram Orthopedics. And I've been encouraged at this conference to, to hear that a lot of what we're working on at, at this, at this start, startup of mine um, are kind of common themes and, and that the industry seems to be kind of buying that we're going toward customized implants and, and more advanced robotics. So, so that, that gives me hope that we're on, on the right path uh, as far as my company goes. Um, I got into startup uh, orthopedics because I was a uh, consultant at Think Surgical, which you guys may know um, was the uh, offspring of RoboDoc, which was actually the first uh, FDA-approved robot before Da Vinci, uh, before any other robotics. Uh, RoboDoc, back in the late 80s, early 90s, was the first uh, robot of any kind that, that was used on, on humans. Um, I got involved with them after they got some financing to kind of um, commercialize the, the, uh, the technology. Um, and I was with them for about five years. And, and what I saw was the potential for robotics to do more than what we, were, what we were using it for, which is to kind of do the same old surgeries with maybe a little bit more precision than we've al always done. Um, but we could actually use robots to do things like put in custom implants. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, so that was kind of the, the impetus for starting uh, Monogram um, to essentially couple uh, custom milling with a, with a special robot with custom implants that are uh, 3D printed and to kind of get that perfect fit and, and uh, improve upon uh, joint implants. Um, so what's, what's worked in my experience? Um, so robotics. So as, as uh, the last speaker said, um, we're still in the first generation of robotics uh, in, in orthopedics. Um, it's kind of, the, the stuff that we're using now is kind of like the Commodore 64 Atari, you know, compared to what's out there in uh, the world of industrial robotics. You know, the, the technology that's in the, the, this, the, the machines that we're currently using in orthopedics are relatively primitive compared to what you would find in like a Tesla factory, for example. They're also very expensive technology, because like Moore's Law, you know, the technology, the, the cost of robotics technology has continued to, to, to fall. So, um, you know, where we're now paying, you know, a million plus dollars in capital expense for an for a orthopedic robot, you know, really the, the cost of these things is coming down precipitously. So you can get a state-of-the-art um, cobot uh, from one of the big uh, industrial robotics companies for forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. So um, I think what you're going to see in robotics is the, the technology is going to improve while the, the prices are, are going to plummet to the point where uh, companies will essentially be able to give the the hospital the robot because they'll they'll be using the robot to drive implant sales, um, you know. So even as primitive as as the current technology that we're using is, it's still really good, and um, it has over the past ten years or so since since we've been using orthopedic robotics, it's gained adoption steadily, and it's not going anywhere, and. Part of the reason for that is that we're starting to see some, some data. We're actually starting to see some, some midterm data on um, partial knees that were done you know, in 2009, 2010 um, that show improved survivorship over manually done um, unis. So that's the kind of data that some surgeons that, that are not necessarily early adopt adopters need to see to, to kind of say, okay, this technology is, uh, is worth it and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy into it. Um, big thing that I'm seeing in my practice, which is kind of disheartening, is that um, people like sports docs in the community that, that were sending me partial knees and total knees and that kind of thing 
are taking a look at, at the Makos and, and some of the other uh, robotic technology out there and saying, you know what, I can do this. And so now sports guys who don't really have training in knee replacement surgery, certainly don't have any training in partial knee replacement, they're doing them because this, this technology is, is, so, is so good that it, it takes an operation that, that is pretty finicky if you do it manually. Um, and turns it into something that's much more reproducible for kind of a lower volume um, sports type type surgeon. So another thing that I, that I find works for, for me is, is I started doing these things called kinematic knees about uh, three years ago. And um, it's kind of a controversial topic in, in, in joints, um, but I think um, we're starting to see some data that when you do a kinematic knee where you're kind of um, resurfacing the joint rather than kind of changing the the angles that you put the implants in, you you get survive you get uh, patient satisfaction scores that are approaching total hip levels. You know, there's this 80 percent um, satisfaction, you know, good to excellent satisfaction rate in total knees, and I think Jack, Dr. Jacobs might uh, agree that. That, that elusive 20% of kind of not super satisfied knee replacements is still, is still out there. So we're kind of, we're still chasing that 20% of knee patients. And what I'm seeing with kinematic alignment is that we're getting a little bit closer to that 90 plus percent um, good to excellent patient satisfaction rate. Um, we're also learning that there's data coming out showing that if we put the tibia in a little bit of varus, which is which is how most tibia's native anatomy is, that um, it it actually is not going to affect the survivorship of, of the implant. There's a big study that that Mayo uh, came out with a year or so ago, looking at a 20-year data, and they they found that even in outliers where they put the tibia in more than five degrees of varus, there was no difference in, in revision rate. So that's, that's uh, added, added fuel to, to the kind of the adoption of this technique. So um, dual mobility, uh, hip replacements, I think is, is solving a problem. You know, we're learning more, and you, you all have probably heard uh, about the kind of evolving knowledge base uh, of the kind of spine uh, pelvis connection. Um, we're, we're, there's more and more research coming out on this. We're understanding it uh, more and more all the time. Um, but there certainly is a connection between the, the spine and the pelvis, and, and dual mobility uh, implants uh, can really help with, with, uh, with solving that problem. There's, there's one paper that uh, that's, has been recently published showing a seven-fold increase in um, dislocation rate after a spine fusion uh, in, a, in a total hip patient. Um, Another, another trend that, that seems to be working is uh, outpatient joints. There's been a lot of talk about AS, ASCs and, and the kind of the increasing prevalence of outpatient joints um, projected to uh, be over 50% of joint replacements in the next five or six years uh, in the United States. So this is a trend that's, that's happening. There's a lot of cost pressure, uh, bundled payments um, on the system that's kind of driving this. And the data is, 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 is reasonably good. You know, there's 30% reduction in, in cost of an outpatient joint as opposed to an inpatient joint. Um, the surgeons have, have financial incentive often with, uh, with ASCs that are, that are driving thing, things. The, the outcomes are, are, uh, sh are being shown to be equivalent in terms of complication rates and readmissions and, and that type of thing. Um, and we're, we're developing better and better risk stratification tools uh, to ensure the safety of, um, of outpatient joints and to make sure that we're risk stratifying appropriately for, for outpatient. So as far as what hasn't worked, I, I just picked a, a couple, couple things uh, out, of, out, of, out of my hat. Uh, Patient-specific instruments was a, was a fad. Uh, I don't know, if, did you ever do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I tried patient-specific instruments for knees uh, a few few years ago when they, when it was a, a hot topic, um, and what I found is it really didn't help me. Um, it kind of slowed the surgery down. The the jigs didn't fit quite right. I bailed more often than I than I wanted to to manual instruments, and 
And honestly, the, the data has not really shown superiority of PSI uh, as opposed to manual. So I think it's largely been abandoned by, by surgeons. And there's, they're still out there, but I don't think uh, nearly as, as common as, as it used to be. Um, cementless tibias are, are definitely getting better, but um, in my own personal experience and some of the, the data with uh, older cementless uh, tibial implants is not great. Um, and I think that we're, we're seeing a trend in um, moving toward more cementless fixation in knees. Our knee patients are getting younger. They're roughly the same age now as our average age for hip, hip replacement. Um, and so the idea of, of not cementing is really attractive, I think, to a lot of surgeons. Um, but cementless fixation has in the past not been super reliable. Um, I put in hydroxyapatite, or not hydroxy, um, hyaluronic acid, um, just to illustrate something that I find in my practice, which is that patients really don't want to have joint replacement surgery, you know, no surprise, um, and they will believe in just about anything to, that will give them hope that, that they can somehow avoid that, that surgery. And so it, it, I, visco supplementation is, is kind of a, a prime example of that. You know, it's, the evidence is not good. It's, it's, it's horrible. And there have been lots and lots of good randomized controlled trial studies done, um, and it's placebo. And um, when I tell my patients the science behind it, they get pissed off at me, which is an interesting response. But because I, I feel like I, you know, I'm trying to give them the science and tell them, no, this is not going to work. And more times than not, they think that I'm trying to talk them into surgery. So that's an that's interesting uh, conundrum. Um, so where I think the industry's going and, and um, We've all mentioned this. Um, 3D printing in metal continues to evolve. And um, so it's making customization of implants not only uh, possible, but also practical in terms of, of uh, time to delivery to the hospital and, um, and cost. Um, so it, the, the cost <coughs> is coming down um, for, for custom implants. You know, it used to be um, that if you wanted a custom tri-flange uh, hip socket, uh, it would take weeks to make and it was very expensive and um, the images had to be manually segmented. So, so a lot of kind of emerging technologies are coming together to, to make mass customization of implants really not only possible, practical, economical, but also really potentially clinically beneficial. So if we're, if we're really careful about not just creating customized implants just for, for the sake of customization, but actually attacking real clinical problems, um, I think that there's a lot of potential here. Uh, it also makes business sense. It's the, there's obviously a huge inventory issue with the big implant companies. So um, moving to customization will, will help solve some of that. Um, and the, the, just the modeling, the, the software and, and computing power that, that's available to allow uh, images to be analyzed and processed is getting better and better, and it's, it's kind of facilitating uh, the move to mass customization. Uh, again, AI deep learning is, is kind of along those lines, this, which is going to support all these new, new technologies. I mentioned cementless tibias before. I think we're, we're getting there. Um, there, some of the newer implants have better data, but again, I think customization and robotics can help quite a bit optimize um, cementless fixation in knees. And I think that that's w be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. I, I think we're going to be some using cementless knees in 10, 15, 20 years, like we do cementless hips, and we're not going to be cement we're not going to be cementing knees anymore in the in the you know medium term future. Um, Smart implants, I think we, we've all kind of mentioned some variant of this, but uh, I think we will start embedding sensors to detect things like aseptic loosening, infection, uh, stability, uh, wear, um, knee motion, etc. cetera. Um, and then last, I, I think that um, g getting past that first generation of robotics to, um, to kind of the next generation, um, one of the things I think will, will happen is we'll start getting away from, from fiducials. 
um, like was mentioned in the last talk, and we will have machine vision. So the robot will be able to see what's in front of it optically. We won't have to place markers. It'll just speed the whole process up, make it less painful for the surgeon, and kind of get rid of some of the fiddle factor and, and really uh, make it almost universal. Um, I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you.